Would you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 6? Acts chapter 6. We have two more weeks in our 21 days of prayer and fasting this week and then the finale next week. Acts 6, verse 1. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Would you pray the prayer out loud behind me before we get into the word of God today, as we've been doing over these last uh, days? Open our ears, O Lord, to hear your word and know your voice. Speak to our hearts and strengthen our wills that we may serve you now and always. Amen. Pentecost happened and with Pentecost came many new converts. And the amazing thing at Pentecost, and sometimes we don't think about this, is there are different kinds of Jewish people in Jerusalem. There are Hebrew Jews who mainly speak probably Aramaic. And then you have these Hellenistic Jews. These are Jewish people that have, that have either traveled to Jerusalem for worship or they have moved from other countries where they were born to get to Jerusalem so that they could, could, could be with God's people there. And when Pentecost happened and the Spirit came down on, on this group of people that were seeking the Lord and, and, des, and, and waiting as Jesus had told them to do, they began to go out and speak in other tongues, other languages. And these these Jews from other places, these foreign-born Jews, started to hear the gospel in their own languages. Their own languages. Some of those could have been Greek, and they might have even had synagogues where they would worship, where they'd hear, hear the message, hear the, the religious service in their own language. But now, they were hearing about Jesus in a language they could identify, and it was a miracle that God did in those days. And thousands of people converted. And there was a beautiful spirit amongst the early church where they were selling things that they owned and sharing things that they owned and they, and they had everything in common. And if you had a need, the church was going to help you with that need. And the apostles began doing signs and wonders and the church said, God, give us more of these signs and wonders and God did. He multiplied those things. And the apostles went out and, and performed miracles. And sometimes people would like bring sick people. And when Peter would walk by, they were even hoping his shadow might fall on somebody. It was an amazing time in the church. Yes, they had one particularly hard issue with um, Ananias and Sapphira who lied about how much money they were giving. But, but in general, the church was seeing great success and great increase until you get to chapter 6, and now there's a church-wide problem. The scripture says, a complaint arose. There was a group of widows who were not receiving their food. Now, before I get into that, I want to talk about complaints in general in the church. I like to call them concerns. Sometimes I get letters and they're concerns, and I call them concerns because I think sometimes complaint sounds like I'm disparaging them. You know, we're supposed to do all things without complaining, as Philippians says, and that's true. We are supposed to do all things without complaining, but we do share concerns about how the church is operating, how the church is functioning, and I hope that for myself, for the other pastors, for the elders of the church, that we would have a posture of approachability, that you could tell us the concerns that you want to bring to our attention. I hope that we would also have a posture of listening and not 
not defensiveness. Because even if, even if, say, we would disagree with the concern that was raised, sometimes I agree, sometimes I disagree, but even if we were to disagree with the concern, I think there's still truth there that needs to be heard. There's probably something in there that we need to hear. And so I'm grateful when people share concerns. Now, the rule I have with concerns that are shared is that you always have to sign your name to the concern. Because if you don't sign your name to the concern, I can't follow up, I can't do the, and we can't do the relational thing of, of talking about it. There, there's no way to have a relationship there with the concern because it's anonymous. And I have a file folder for those kind of anonymous concerns. It's my garbage can. I admit it, it's my garbage can. They get filed, I never look at them again. So um, definitely let us know when you have a concern to put your name on it because the relationship's important. The relationship's very important that we can talk about it as brothers and sisters. Now, we've been through a pandemic, right? And, and, and we're still kind of in it. And, and people have shared concerns. Sometimes those concerns are that, that we are too strict in our, uh, uh, the way we're handling our approach to the pandemic. Other people have told us that we're too loose in our approach to the pandemic. And some people think we're right on. Some of those responses are absolutely correct, and some of them are gravely mistaken, and I won't tell you who's who. So, um, and we'll be okay. But, but I do, I, I do want to listen to those things, and I want to strongly consider them and, and, and make sure that we're handling things correctly, not only with the pandemic, of course, but with all the things that we do at Grace Church. We are a family, and families talk about things. So I just want to put that out there as we talk about this complaint that has arose. The complaint arises, and, and part of it is like, how do we understand the complaint in Acts chapter 6? What's going on here? Well, think about it. You've got widows, and I'm going to use the word maybe a lot here because we're trying to reconstruct a social situation that, that Luke hasn't told us everything about. So I'm going to say the word maybe a few times. Maybe some widows have moved from other countries because they want to be in Jerusalem. They want to live with God's people, the Jewish people, their people. And maybe they spent some of their life savings to get there. And they want to be there. That's kind of the center of it all. Sometimes you see bumper stickers that kind of reflect this notion. I saw a Texas one one time. I'm not from Texas. Anybody from Texas? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I saw a Texas one, t- one time that says, I wasn't born in Texas, but I got here as fast as I could. You know, and, and I think people feel that way, and, and, and a Jewish person might feel that way about Jerusalem. I want to be there. I wasn't born there, but I got here as fast as I could. I'm a widow. I'm aging. I spent the money that I had saved, and now I'm here. Now, maybe they got there, and they found out that they couldn't live inside the city. Maybe the property values were too high at the time, or maybe there wasn't enough property to go around. Maybe they're living in the suburbs, and they really need Meals on Wheels to bring the food to them, or Camels on Wheels, or Donkeys on Wheels, you know? Take it out to them. Maybe they're in the suburbs. Maybe they can't travel in easily to get to the food, or maybe they speak Greek, and the food instructions are in Aramaic. Do do you see, when you start to reconstruct it, there could be a number of things that have gone wrong. Or maybe the worst one I could suggest, I don't know if this is true or not, but maybe there was just some apathy and people didn't care enough to make sure that those Hellenistic widows received what they needed to receive. Again, I don't know, but I know that it was a problem. I know that the issue was real. I know that when a concern is raised, it doesn't necessarily mean that there was bad motives behind it. And when you raise concerns, I don't, I don't think you assume that there's bad motives behind it and we got to let them know, you know. That there, there's genuine concern. And let's be the family we need to be. And so this issue is raised. It is a problem. It's a cultural problem. You might even argue it's an ethnic problem between these two different types of Jewish people. Let's talk about the problems, though, that we do know that are happening there, and let's see if we can identify those things, and then what's the solution? Number one, one of the problems we see here, I should have put problems in quotes. That's what I should have done. 
But the problem is the church is growing. Some people like small churches, and it's nice when you're small and everybody knows your name, and if you get bigger, it's like, oh no. And, and, and I did have, uh, you know, I, I think one of the things people think sometimes is, do, do the church leaders at Grace Church have designs to become the mega church? Is, is that our goal? And I can honestly tell you it's not. It's not the goal. The goal is the Great Commission. That's the goal. And, 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 the, goal, and, and the Great Commission is not produce a fantastic church service so you can attract people from other churches to come to your church. That's not the Great Commission. Although I do believe that God does tap people on the shoulder sometimes and say, hey, I'd like you to leave here and go there. I believe God does that, and you've got to follow the voice of God, and maybe that's how you landed here, perhaps. But that's not the Great Commission. And the goal is not to have the best church growth strategy around. The goal is make disciples. It's an unchanging goal, but how we do it might need to change. I mean, I mean what I mean by that is, our methods, you know, we might, might just need to think about how our strategies work. Um, if you want to know, why do a church health consultant like we did last week, what's the point of that? Is it that I believe that there's problems all over the place in Grace Church and we need somebody to be the bad guy? Uh, no, I, I don't think that. If you want to know the primary reason I think it's good to have somebody take a look at Grace Church and give us some thoughts and some feedback, it's this. Because we want to do as great a job as possible reaching people and fulfilling the Great Commission. If you want to know the central reason why I think it's a good idea to have someone from the outside look, it's for that reason. It's a missional reason. How can we do better at that? Now, not how can we have slicker worship services and and, and really cool stuff. And and I also want to relate this a little bit to... uh, Most churches have seen the opposite problem during the pandemic. They've seen uh, the opposite of growth. They've seen people leave. Sometimes there's a great reshuffling. Uh, But but whatever. Um, Some of our people, our dear friends, have still not returned. And health is often a major factor there. And so we as Grace Church continue to reach out to people on a monthly basis once or twice a month, to people whose health has prevented them from returning. We understand that there has been a great loss of life during this pandemic, and that is serious to us. And for the people watching online, you're special to us, and you're still special to us, and your names are still on our list, and we still think about you, and we pray about you. On the other hand, there are some folks that fall into a category of, I'm healthy enough to come back to church, I'm not worried about that. Maybe you're vaccinated or whatever, but you've just chosen not to. I worry that worship services can become like products that we're offering. Have have you heard our fantastic worship? Have you you heard this sermon? It's really going to be good. And um, it's some consumeristic kind of thing. And the online church becomes a way of consuming without participating, without really being part of the church. And for some people that have not returned, and I know you're all like here today, so it doesn't feel like you get me stepping on your toes, but maybe it's those online. If you haven't returned, why not? What reason can you give legitimately why you haven't regathered with God's people? If it's not health, what is it? And is it legitimate? I know I'm stepping on toes there, and I know that might make some people angry. Um, But if you're angry, and you leave Grace Church, and you go somewhere else, well, good, you went somewhere else. A plus. So, okay. Um, uh, but, But you need to be somewhere, and you need to join with God's people and not forsake the assembly. So the problem is the church is growing, and with church growth come problems. That, that, that's just how it is. More people, more stuff to deal with. Hellenistic widows that are being overlooked. We don't know if, if, what the reason is exactly for that, but it was definitely happening. And the answer to church growth and the problems that come with it is this. We need more wise, spirit-filled leaders. That's verse 3. We need more 
wise, spirit-filled leaders. Hold on to that. Second problem. Uh, Second problem the church is facing is the problem is the least of these are being ignored. Whenever the church has conflict, and sometimes people, you know, again, whenever I talk about church conflict, people want to ask, oh, is Grace Church going through church conflict? I didn't know. Let me find out more. Uh, Well, well, the good thing is I don't feel like we're going through church conflict, so that's a great thing. But I'm going to keep preaching on it and harping on it because I don't want to go through it. Because when I know people are in conflict, the mission gets ignored. People in need get ignored. We get get inwardly focused so that the least of these don't get taken care of. The least of these would be children. It would be elderly folks. And we do have an aging congregation as well here. What are we doing for them? Uh, they get, sometimes people get ignored. And, and sometimes it's, this is the one that really grabs my heart. Sometimes it's the people who are just immature in their faith. They're, they're the baby Christian. And we're too busy doing other stuff that we miss those people that need us to walk alongside them and help them take steps in their faith. And, and we look at them and go, what's your problem? You're so immature. But, but the answer is more wise Spirit-filled leaders to walk alongside them. That's the answer, to walk alongside them and do God's work. So um, that's a problem. And, and, and the problem can be, you know, it, it's like the problem of two parents taking their kids to an amusement park, and the parents are arguing in the amusement park. They're, they're arguing about this or that. I don't know why they saved the amusement park day to argue about it, but, but one of their kids just wanders away because they're so distracted by what they're arguing about. And the little one goes and talks to Bugs Bunny for a while or something. <laughs> and, and, and that's the danger. So I always want to put that in front of us and say, let's make sure we handle disagreements whenever they come up, as soon as they come up, so they don't keep us from doing what we're really supposed to be doing. I think the pandemic could be a great distraction from doing what we're being called to do. Because we can get so focused on how are we handling it? Are we doing a good job with it? Are we being safe? Did you remember your mask or did you remember your Bible? You know, I mean, that's, that was a funny conversation I had this morning already. You know, what did you remember to bring with you, right? And, uh, and so we got to think about those things and not get distracted from why we are here. And it's not to hear a good message. Even though I get it, a good message, a, a biblical message is very important as part of our worship service. Let's not miss the least of these. Number uh, number three. The problem is leaders are not called to do everything. Uh, Look at this. Verse two. The twelve are summoned about this problem, and they say, quote-unquote, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, this bothers some people because it sounds like the apostles are conceited. Like, we are above the serving of tables. I I love this example because it's the one I always think of when I think of this passage. Uh, After a ministry event one time, I I picked picked up a vacuum. This wasn't at Grace. I don't do this anymore. Just kidding. But I I was vacuuming the, the fellowship hall. You know, I was vacuuming things up. And, and one of our senior saints, a dear woman, a great servant came up to me and she like took the vacuum from me. Like you shouldn't be doing that, pastor. And, she, and I wanted to wrestle with her, you know, but I was afraid I might knock her down. So I let her have it. Um, <laughs> you can have the vacuum. I'll find something else to do before I go home. But we're not above this. And Jesus washed feet. None of us are, uh, are, are somehow above this. And so we read this and we go, uh-oh, the uh, apostles are conceited. And I would say, no, that's not what's going on here. They're not conceited, they're called. And they know what their calling is. Do you know what your calling is? Do you know what your spiritual gifts are? They, they, they know what their calling is, and, and they view this problem as so important that they want to put their best people on it. They see, they, they see the feeding of widows as so important that, that someone needs to just take care of that. And they see their calling is so important, they don't want to become distracted from doing it. I think they've elevated it. Now, I can also prove that with the, with the Greek word use. I, I can prove what I just said, in other words. Uh, 
when you see verse 2, they say it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve, diakoneo is the word there, diakoneo, to serve tables. It's not right for us to do that. Now, then they say in verse 4, but we will devote ourselves, uh, sorry, where'd I go? Devote ourselves to prayer and to the diakoneo of the word. We're not going to do the diakoneo of tables. We're going to do the diakoneo of the word. You see what they do there? There's actually, I mean, I mean they're saying the word and, and the tables, they're both diakoneo. Just talking word usage here. And so you should never think, well, wherever I've been serving is just, you know, it's lesser than what the other people are doing that seem like, like a great ministry. I'm doing this other thing that's lesser. You shouldn't go down that road because leaders are not called to do everything. There's, there's different kinds of things in the church. And if you want to see the power of God in the church, just try using your gift. If you want to see power in the church, Holy Spirit power, just start using your spiritual gift. That's where the power is. That's how I read my Bible, at least. That's where the power is. Leaders can't do everything. And, and uh, it's kind of funny. This often comes up when churches are hiring pastors. Uh, three years ago, when I was looking for pa- at pastoral positions, I-, I interviewed at a few different places. And when you look at job descriptions, they're very interesting. It's, it's like, we want a pastor that preaches amazing sermons. Give, give us challenging sermons. We want a pastor that can strongly evangelize the lost. We want a pastor that can manage our finances and manage our staff. And we want a pastor to do visionary leadership. And we want our pastor to, and, and they have this list that just keeps going and going and going and going. And, I, and when I read that, I go, you want Jesus. But he hasn't come back yet. So you get me, you know? Uh, and that's, that's the truth. And, and when, when I would interview in those churches, by the way, I'm a weird guy that I enjoy interviewing at churches. I'm just getting a little rusty at it. I haven't done it recently, okay? But um, I enjoy the process because it's kind of fun to ask the questions and find out what people really want. Like, what do you really want in your pastor? Are you looking for a shepherd to do counseling and care ministries? Are you looking for that preacher? Like, what do you really want? Because unless you get Jesus, you can't have everything. It's like, it's like, it's like the, you know, you know the, um, at Christmas time, the, the, the catalog, the, the, the J.C. Penney catalog that would come in the mail. I know you young kids, you don't even know what that's about. But they used to send these big catalogs, and you would circle the stuff you want in there. And some of you were like, um, some of you were like, you, you, you were like restrained. And you circled a couple things that you really thought you had a good shot at you realistic kids. But some of you were overly optimistic and you circled everything. Who's that in, in the room, just so I know who you are? Yeah, this, the whole thing, the whole page, the whole page. You aimed big, and, and some of you aimed big for your leaders, right? They should be able to do it all. And the reality is they just can't treat them like human beings, you know? And so um, I keep bumping this. All right. A little animated today. Um, what, what you need is... What the church needs is more wise, spirit-filled leaders. And it might be you. It might be you. Um, I'm uh, privileged to be able to say today, uh, one of the things the elders do at the uh, end of a year is they elect a new church chairman. And uh, we elected uh, Greg Scott to be the new church elder chairman. Greg, if you're here, I'll just have you stand up in the back. He's, he's behind me. Um, yeah. So when you send your concerns in, Greg Scott people, Greg, no, no. All right. I am uh, so thrilled Greg answered the call to do that work and chair our meetings and do some leadership at Grace Church alongside me. I counted a privilege it was also a privilege to work with, um, um, with, with Larry as well. Larry Stevick, I'll have you put your hand up just for a second, not to get, you know, all the accolades, but um, to, to, to do two years in a pandemic with Larry and to work alongside him, uh, a steady hand, a wise man, and a privilege to work beside. So I just want to put that out there as well. Um, I have been blessed. <laughs> and I say I have been blessed because I got to work with this, these guys but I believe the church has been blessed, too, to have wise, spirit-filled leaders. And, and that's what we need 
And it might be you as well. You might be one of those because we need more. We need more. So um, leaders aren't called to do everything. Uh, the rule that I think every church should always break is this one. 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. You just got to keep breaking that rule. Whether it's leaders or whether it's volunteers, leaders or followers, we just got to keep breaking that rule and have people stepping up into positions and serving and using their gift. If you don't use your gift, you don't get to see the power. That's, that's how it is. You want Holy Spirit power? Start using your spiritual gifts. Uh, by the way, uh, this is a way early, man, kind of way early uh, uh, plug, but we will be doing a, a serving uh, seminar, I believe coming up late February, early March, somewhere around there. Early plug for that, so um, in any case. Um, I've been encouraged over these last months by new folks that have come in the doors at Grace. We're so glad you're here. We hope this becomes a family. We hope you feel that when you're here. We hope that we'll be paying more and more attention to how to, how to create a family environment here, especially during this time where people have felt disconnected. That is like hot in my heart. Like, how do, how do we still have that feeling of the gathering of God's people and the enjoyment of being together? Like, that's a big deal to me. And, um, but, but I am super encouraged. Now, I know, oh, I forgot my main point wonder what my main point is. Um, <laughs> there's my main point. Uh, the church needs, and, and, and God is doing this. If you pay attention to churches that are losing pastors and people that are, um, and I say this sadly, people that are failing for different reasons and, ha- and, and leaders that have integrity issues, the answer is more wise, spirit-filled leaders. Now, I noticed that these I'm going to say a couple things about the leaders they chose. There's the seven. Seven's a great number for a group of people, right? Seven, perfect. And uh, you notice that their names are mostly Greek-oriented names. That's, a, that's on purpose. I, I think these are people who were close to the situation. Maybe they knew these widows personally. Again, I say maybe. But their names seem to reflect that they were not the, the Hebrew Jewish people, but the Hellenistic Jewish people that are resolving this problem. They were close to the people, and they cared about what was going on there. They were the seven. The other thing that I don't know about the seven, and maybe you've thought about this, and you can tell me what you think. You notice that the next passage that you get after the seven is you get Stephen. And you don't, get, you don't see Stephen serving the tables. Like, like that, that's kind of like he's doing that. We know he's doing that. But here's what you see Stephen doing. Verse 8, Stephen, full of grace and power. There's two things I'd love to have true of me and and all of us. Full of grace and power, uh, was doing great wonders and signs amongst the people. So it wasn't even just the apostles that were now doing these signs. Now it's this other group of people that are doing this. And you read this, and Philip also comes up, right, in, in, in the book of Acts. And you read this, and you're like, these guys... They were waiting tables, but they were doing amazing things. Again, I'm going to encourage you, never think that your ministry and your spiritual gift is just so ordinary that you're not going to see amazing things. We need the best people in all the places of ministry. The best people in all the places of ministry. That's what we need. And uh, this is a great introduction to Stephen. So I always wonder, like, if I could talk to Stephen one day, I, I, you know, you'd think you'd ask, so why is it you got introduced serving tables, but then you went on and did these amazing things and actually became a martyr? You're like, what's up with that? You, you were so much more, weren't you? You know, and I think for all of our servants, you're so much more because the Holy Spirit is using you. You're so much more. So anyway, that's, that's what I'd love to think more about too. Now, verse seven, and there was great success, right? And, and verse six, they set, their, they set them before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. The responsibility of the church then, and yes, I do think this is descriptive, but I think it's also a good way of looking at how we do leadership. The responsibility of the church is to choose and pray for, pray over and pray for their leaders. To select them, 
to make sure that they're above reproach, and then to and then to release them into areas of ministry. And they're releasing leaders that are full of the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. They're like James three says, "Who's wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by the way you live your life." Their lives reflect a life of wisdom. They have power because they're serving in different in, in areas of the church according to their calling. Find those people. Release them for ministry. Bless them. And watch them do the work of the Lord. I think it's our responsibility as a church to keep praying for our leaders at church. You just, I say this very personally, you don't know what a leader walks through when they say yes to leading. It's, it's a unique thing that happens. And those of you that have been elders or ministry leaders, you, you know what I'm talking about. Here, here's the story I tell when I talk about people stepping into leadership. Young lady in her 20s going into a crew, formerly Campus Crusade. She's doing fundraising to fund her position. And so she's talking to different people in the church and, and having these uh, fundraising conversations. And at one of those fundraising conversations, she's at a coffee house. And during that fundraising conversation at that coffee house, the wall fell on her. A wall in the coffee house fell on her. Now, I, she still did the ministry, you know, she still did what she was called to do. But it also caused physical things. I mean, there, there's after effects of that kind of thing happening to you. And you say, how did that happen? I know when people step into ministry leadership, elder, deacon, pastor, taking over a ministry, there's opposition. And so we need prayer for ministry leaders. It just has to be. If you've walked that path, then you know what I'm talking about. Discouragement's real. Struggle's real. Feeling like you're not making a difference. All of that is real. And Satan is real. We have a real enemy. So I love the end of this, of this little passage. The word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly. At the end of the day, why is Grace Church here? We're here to make disciples. Has Bloomington Normal been completely discipled? No. Then we've got more work to do. We're not putting out a product. We're sharing the gospel. And I want to preach the best sermons I can preach. But that's not the end goal. The end goal is the discipleship that comes through the preaching of the word. And you being challenged to go out into the community and share the word. And to see more disciples come to Christ. And to get there, we're going to need more wise, spirit-filled leaders. That's my last word. Now I'd like to invite you to pray with me for the leaders at Grace Church. I have three segments of prayer like we have done in weeks past. I'm going to put up three groups of people, the elders, ministry leaders, and pastors. Actually, elders and pastors overlap, but I think you get the point. Um, we're, I'm going to have some time in, in silent prayer that you would do this in your own hearts for the leaders of Grace Church. Number one is that our elders would remain above reproach. That means free of worldliness and idols, resisting temptation. And that they would govern with wisdom in the Holy Spirit. Gee, where did we get that from? I think you heard that. Would you pray for that now in your own hearts? Father, I pray for these men who have answered the call to be an elder. I do pray against any idolatry and any worldliness, any temptation. I pray that they would pursue purity. I pray that they would be men who follow you and seek you. And I also pray that 
and seeking you, you would fill them with your spirit and fill them with your wisdom. They would govern according to your word. I pray that when decisions have to be made, that Bibles are open, scripture fills our minds, and that we would do what pleases you. I pray for those who may be elders in the future here at Grace Church, that you begin preparing them now in your own laboratory, in your own way, getting them ready for the work that you're going to have them do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Number two, would you pray now in your own hearts that our ministry leaders would experience the Lord's blessing on their work? This is such a, it's still such a weird time to do the work of ministry, thinking about how to handle pandemic concerns and all the rest. Would you pray for them and pray that they would not grow weary in doing good. Pray they disciple people well. Would you pray that now in your hearts? Father, we ask for our ministry leaders that you would strengthen the work of their hands, sharpen their minds with the decisions they make. May their disciple-making be so on point, so intentional, that they would see believers taking the next steps in their faith. I pray that over our grace groups and our Sunday school classes and our, our tutoring ministry and uh, all of the programs of Grace Church, our men's ministry and women's ministry, our Bible studies, they'd be focused on disciple-making. I pray that our ministry leaders would not be discouraged. I pray they wouldn't grow weary. I pray they wouldn't lose heart. Would you encourage them today? In Jesus' name, amen. Finally, would you pray for our pastors that they would stay encouraged in the Lord? I think that's another theme that we all need and that they would shepherd with the Holy Spirit's wisdom, with his power. Would you pray that now? Father, I thank you for the pastors at Grace Church, these men that I am privileged to walk with, to serve with, to lead with. I pray you bless them and myself in the pastoral work you've called us to do. I pray for encouragement when the challenges come. I pray when, uh, when we encounter difficulty, we'd look to you. I pray we'd walk with you strongly and with integrity. And I pray that our shepherding would be caring, insightful, merciful, powerful, and bold. Would you use us as your servants and your shepherds? We're grateful to be called to minister to your flock. It is truly yours, Lord Jesus. Pray this in your name. Amen.